some CEO from some company giving it the beans on the scooter there. Dive bomb. Dive bomb. This is the unofficial Eurobike crit. Chasing the CEO, Mr. Shareholder. Oh, he's done him. Oh no, emergency barrier repairs. Sending it up the inside. Grunewald can be proud of that one. Oh, I've maxed out the e-bike. So, hi everyone, welcome back to the channel and welcome to just outside Eurobike. Now I'm just gonna give you a quick summary before we take a look at all the good stuff, all the tech. I'm gonna spend most of the time in Hall 9, which is that sort of Asian supplier area. It's actually where most of the innovation is, I think. And the big brand halls is kind of just a bit of a circle jerk for the, the big brands marketing departments to talk to each other. There is some cool innovation in there, so we'll go check that out as well. Hall 9, the supply area, is actually closed on the public show days. So I guess they don't want you to see where stuff is actually made. That's a bit of a shame, really, because there's a lot of innovation in there. I haven't bumped into GCN before you ask. I've bumped into GCN Espana, but I haven't bumped into Ollie. That's a bit of a shame, because I was going to probe him about his uh, 10 mile time trial progress, but maybe we'll catch up with him today. It is Friday and I'm leaving in a couple of hours, so it doesn't look like we're going to catch up with those guys. Now, before you say, where's this, where's that? It is impossible to film everything. Even the big channels won't do that. It's just so much to see. So you have to really have to pick and choose. Now, I haven't been to Eurobike for about six years, and what I've really noticed this year is the chalk and cheese difference between the sort of e-bike engineering and the normal stuff. So sort of your, your normal carbon frames where they struggle to make a round hole at the bottom back it creaks. And then you look at the engineering in like the pinion e-bike motor gearbox system and the NTN stuff and the torque sensors is chalk and cheese. So there are going to be quite a few deep dives into really nerdy stuff because that's, that's what my background is in uh, like robotics and gearboxes and torque sensors and stuff. How's the reception been from the brands to, to YouTubers like myself and, and maybe Hanvini? Well, it has sometimes a little been a bit frosty. Uh, we had a really good meeting with Classified. We spoke to their CEO and CTO about you know their claims, efficiency claims, and sort of spoke about the marketing strategy of it all as well. And I think they're gonna involve us a little bit on the kind of launch of their white paper, which will be really cool. And we might even get a teardown of the hub to see the internals, which obviously anyone can do. Shimano have got it on their desk in pieces, I guarantee. But uh, yeah, we had a really, really good chat with them. We were up there for about an hour and a half. They realized we're not just trolls, and we're not just YouTube trolls, and we're actually sort of speaking about engineering backgrounds. They warm up and actually we have a really good conversation with most of the brands. Now, what are my aims of being here? Well, I want to put faces to all the names of the wheel brands and frame companies and Chinese carbon and stuff that I get sent. So that's been really good to check out the vibe of the people actually sending me stuff because when you're just talking on WeChat and WhatsApp and email, you just don't know what they're like. And then secondly, my other big aim is to get in front of more Western brands, more Western wheel brands. You guys are always asking when I do all the wheel testing and stuff, can we have some Western brands for context? It's like Zip, MV, DC Swiss. So I've been talking to a couple of brands and they've been really, really positive actually. I got palmed off by Zip or SRAM. I got palmed between like four or five different people. Waited about half an hour to speak to someone and then they left. So a little bit arrogant, <laughs> I think. Uh, they weren't that interested. But good response from Fast Forward, good response from Scope, which are an interesting Dutch brand who are supplying DSM. It puts those Asian brands in context. So, so thanks to all the patrons again for sponsoring this trip, supplying me the funds to pay for all the German strip clubs. I mean, uh, flights and accommodation. And yeah, it wouldn't have been possible without those guys. This is, I don't get paid to do this. This is my, my, my holiday, taking holiday to come here. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been all right. I'll probably come again next year. But don't give us a sub, because that one is that's not a joke at the moment. Give us a thumbs up, like, and subscribe. And we'll see you in the next one. So I'm here on the Trigon stand. This is a brand from Taiwan. Gonna have a, look at, a little look at these uh, monocoque carbon wheels. Very special. Quite sure of the stiffness of these. They look pretty stiff. Maybe too stiff for UK shitty pothole roads, but yeah, pretty interesting. No idea of the aerodynamics or the compliance or anything, but uh, maybe I'll try and get a set of those for the wheel test, test the uh, outer plane stiffness and the aerodynamics. Let's have a little look at the frame. The AR1 frame, I think this is called, all rounder. And it's got golf ball dimples on the head tube and fork and somewhere on the seat tube. Kind of looks like I've done a shot paint job on my BMW with a rattle can and the paint's bubbled up but it's not it's supposed to be like that it's uh, dimples no idea if that's going to work at these Reynolds numbers that might just be marketing no idea what I do really like is the integrated blips climbing shifters on their own integrated handlebar that's pretty cool and they're actually working even on the display which is nice to see uh, you've got thinned out seat stays for that horrible buzzword compliance 
that actually most of the compliance comes from the seat post and the tyre. Uh, massive tyre clearance, it's good to see, uh, although that is quite a skinny tyre. It looks like it's 25 mil that's not really pumped up, so yeah, you could probably fit a 32 in there, no problem. And yeah, just quite a nice all round bike, I really like that to be honest, it's really cool. Nice combination of aerodynamics and simplicity and lightweight. So it's like when you go to your grand's house and just got one of those sort of like non-slip bath mats. I reckon they've just cut one up and stuck it under the uh, the clear coat because you can see the carbon weave through that red lacquer, and then you've got the dimples on there. Uh, they're sort of on the leading edge of the fork as well, and they are. Oh, this one hasn't got it on the on the seat tube. That's unusual because the other one did. So maybe this is a prototype or V1. Here's the Sapa bike, the completely non-adjustable cockpit, non-adjustable reach, non-adjustable stack, and it is called the Dream Maker. The only good thing I think about this bike is the tyre clearance. I'm not sure about Dream Maker. No, not for me that. It's a bit like a sort of hotel you might stay in in Dubai. They've got a, a wheel building machine spokes in, tensions them up. So you've got a little carbon brush there, which is obviously going to ground so it doesn't cause sparks and start blowing shit up in the factory, especially if there's paint in the same factory. That could be a massive bomb waiting to happen. Is that better than me doing it in my pants on the kitchen floor? This is a brand called EXS, and they're making their own carbon wheel sets, handlebars, integrated and normal handlebars, ultra light wheels here, tubulars. They're in handlebars made in Charmin, and really nice one-piece integrated bars that fit different bikes, a bit like the Fastsports F1, and just normal round handlebars, quite nice shape, very compact, flare drops, all that, all that jazz. And yeah, having spoken to the CEO, they are looking for a distributor in Europe and North America. I can't believe we can't get this stuff because it does look really, really nice. The bar bag there with boas on uh, and the boa actually has a separate container which acts on in the center of the bar boat which actually tightens down everything inside the bag so it doesn't wrap around so your phone's nicely protected but yeah they're looking for distribution in Europe uh, I think Joe from Pandaponia should get on this it's got titanium cranks but very similar to the EE cranks but again he specifically said they've done a lot quite different on these and they've got a different button profile and tube profile for all the titanium cranks, whether they're sort of the XC, the road, the gravel, the downhill ones, they even go to enduro and downhill. And they're made in Guangdong. Uh, the bike packing stuff is from Guangzhou, South China. And yeah, just cool original stuff on EXS. Take a quick look at those. I thought they were Fox factory forks, but they are just blatant copies. Like, why do they do that? Who likes that shit? So this is something that I've wanted to check out for a while. L2, wanted to see it with my own eyes, quite a nondescript little stand, I thought it would be bigger, you know, kind of talk of the town on YouTube and that, certain YouTubers like Luke from Mr. Trace Velo. Let's have a real deep look at this, so start with the battery, first of all everything looks like Shimano, but it's not, it's slightly different of course, the connectors are slightly different, I thought this might be interchangeable with the i2, but it isn't, it's got their own proprietary connectors, I guess they have to. Um, rear mech, it's got a sort of carbon injected nylon standard, they call it carbon fibre but it's carbon fibre reinforced plastic, injection moulded, pretty standard really, pins, stainless pins and circlips, um, looks like AMI bushings, similar to Shimano but they're a bit more exposed. The cable entry is a little bit exposed, on there. But yeah, it looks pretty good. It looks, it looks pretty good actually. Quite impressed. The levers feel a lot more quality than I thought they would. The rubber's pretty hard. It's not saggy at all. And the buttons have a really nice clip. Um, didn't think they would. But yeah, quite impressive actually. I mean, it's based on Shimano. It's pretty blatant, but they assure me they're not infringing. So there we go, pedaling away. I'm going to get tendonitis on this. Giving it some welly. It's quite a lot of load. That oh, shift's really good actually. It's not too nice on the back. Does feel really good. A bit hard. And very slim, so it's going to quite a lot of pressure on the hand, but pretty good. So weirdly, for a group set, the front shifted better than the rear did. The rear was really clunky going up the block. 
I noticed the chain was just sitting up on the teeth before dropping down. But the front, couldn't fault that. It was really good. What puts a lot of people off is the lack of distribution. And I said, where's your shop? And he just said, AliExpress. And I was like, well, yeah, that's your issue, mate. They are looking for distribution, obviously. It's, it's pretty difficult at the moment. But they're based in Zhuhai in China, which is near Macau, near, near Hong Kong. And they own everything, their uh, production through to uh, all the test labs and everything. And he also mentioned that they are continuously improving it. So this is like V1 point something and they're on V2 point something. And I said, well, what, what do customers do when they get V1.9 and then a week later you release V2? Um, when are you going to finish and like draw a line in the sand and call that your product? Because I think that puts a lot of customers off. I guess it's a Western thing and maybe in Asia they don't care so much. And he said, uh, well, you've got a two year warranty. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. That was, uh, that was his answer. So I think I might hold off with my own money on that one just at the moment. So there's this whole 9.1. And if you want to start a bike brand, this is where you come to find your wheels, your frames, carbon or hydroformed. You sit down, you open the catalogue and you talk prices. Now there's a brand I gave a good roasting to, uh, but they've upped their game since then. And we'll ask them in a minute if they think that was beneficial or not. But yeah, we'll drop back to Elite in a minute. The patent holders of the carbon spoke world in Xiamen. You see all the different types here. I've got some of their prototypes. They're sort of in-house wheels on show, which I'm not sure if they're selling direct to consumer, but we'll see this is the, the kind of spoke that you've seen on a lot of the wheels that I review on the channel. And they've got some of their sort of prototype wheels out on show. So sort of one piece hub flange design there and they're bonded into the flange and obviously adjustable at the rim edge and then fully adjustable ones like you're normally used to seeing with the taper lock ends it's kind of the normal one and uh, yeah seriously impressive they've got some automotive stuff on show here with a very interesting uh, finish on this rim Dimpled, it's sort of like coarse knurling, some weird finish. And then a one piece flange again, set a lock, very unique. So we've got fast quartz, one of the oldest, the best. And we can see which uh, German brands are working with fast quartz to make uh, OEM stuff. But, you know, no problem with that, they are some of the best quality rims in the business. Jarman OGs seems to be having a helmet malfunction. All right, so I'm here on the NTN Europe stand. I told them they're going to have to lower their standards if they want to get into the bicycle industry. But this caught my eye because uh, I've been in torque sensors for many years, and they are trying to get their torque sensor technology into e-bike drive systems. So who have got a little demo, and I'll show you that in a minute. But basically, how it works is you've got this this output plate. Uh, this torque plate with a compliant ligament system inside it and you mount one encoder to the center and one encoder to the outside and you basically measure the twist which you can calibrate for torque in the bicycle application it works quite well because you can get that blue part which is the plastic version of that in quite a small axial space now i appreciate this is very nerdy for most people they probably don't care about e-bike drive systems but this is probably one of the most elegant torque sensors i've seen in an e-bike drive system because it has a very small axial width and there's no hysteresis like you get on strain gauges. There's no problem with adhesives. Uh, the only mechanical hysteresis you have to worry about is, is the bolt. So that brown ring in the middle is the kind of input encoder and the output encoder is the one on the outside or vice versa. And the way it works is this little magnetic wheel has magnetic pole pairs arranged in it and there's a tiny reader. This is their own one, but IC House is a big supplier of magnetic encoder readers and magnetic wheels. And yeah, it's a very efficient way of measuring uh, crank angle, pedaling rate, and instantaneous torque. With very little noise, very high accuracy. It's probably the most nerdy thing you've probably seen in this video, but uh, something that caught my eye, and it's a massively booming market, are the e-bike drive systems. This, this technology is used in ABS sensors in automotive. So measuring uh, wheel, wheel angle and wheel velocity very, very accurately. I'm at the wind space stand. Steve, my wonderful assistant, is going to take me through the new mega wheels with the carbon flange. So, for this new item, we just launched the during the Shanghai show in the early of May, 
and the compare that we start our the uh, the older flagship hyper ranger we do have several features that I can mention and introduce to you. The first one is the carbon uh, spokes. In hyper is uh, divided each component, but for this one is uh, the, the, the spokes, is the integrated one. And also for this one, uh, it's quite a stiffness. The other point is for the uh, hub. For the hub compared with hyper, this one is ratchet. Okay. okay, so there's another features and uh, generally compared with hyper we have some weight advantages compared with the, uh, the hyper so there's the uh, several features here mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the rims is a little different but the spec is the same so this whole nine is really interesting because traditionally this is all suppliers so if you are a western brand and wanted to sticker up a set of Chinese wheels and put your name on it or you're an OEM bike company this is where you come but now you've got people like Elite and Fast Sports and Windspace who are doing direct to consumer so they really shouldn't be in oh my god what the fuck in China you call this quiet quiet right quiet yeah, yeah it's my microphone I'm here with the uh, Elite wheels obviously you've seen them on my channel before Hambini's turned up we've got Peter from cyclisthub.com and then Rita is marketing for Elite and Patrick brand manager for Elite. Yeah. Originally you sent me some Elite drive wheels for reviewing on my channel and maybe my review was not so positive. Do you think in general that was a good thing or a bad thing? I think uh, 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 <laughs> I think a true review is very good for the brand. Not, not just uh, like uh, help us to improve but also help the audience to understand the product truly so that's important uh, I don't think it's a bad thing I know there's some problem with our bearing before and uh, we fix that and uh, do the improvement I think is good for our product why do you not make hookless rims for road bikes I think if enough people want uh, to have hookless road wheels then we could consider making them we're talking or uh, elite we're talking about wind tunnel testing yeah, uh, the, the error margins are too big. I think these days, wind tunnel testing is more of a marketing exercise. Um, better off doing weight and inertia because they're easy to measure and the rider will feel it. Yeah, uh, can you please explain the crosswind stability of the wheels? Like, what uh, does it influence? Crosswind stability, the, the biggest driver, I think, is just the depth and then the inertia of, of the wheels, which m mainly comes from the weight. Yeah, front wheel, front wheel only, I would say front wheel depth and the inertia and if the mass is concentrated at the rim I think it's a more stable wheel it's more of a flywheel effect if you've got a very light rim and a relatively heavier hub I think it may feel a bit more twitchy but the aerodynamics is, is impossible to speculate I think uh, the rim shape v-shape versus u-shape well I think in steady state CFD and wind tunnel you can test a later kind of separation or stalling on a u-shape or toroidal shape but again it's all very theoretical until you actually do any testing outdoors because all the outdoor conditions are different i don't know if you've got anything to add to that no <laughs> 30 grams apparently the world's lightest through axle so you've got a carbon fiber shaft with the hex molded in or broached in but i assume it's molded and then i'm told that is fixed on so the aluminium end the thread is fixed on just like the carbon spoke is so it's got that kind of taper lock technology which is patented and you'll also notice there's a flat or a keyway on there so it's not completely round and that's what reacts the torque so in theory it can't come off quite clever I'm not sure I trust those yet I'll let some other guinea pigs try try those out but super light and yeah I quite like the kind of 80s gaming retro branding but also here in the in the booth next door is some of the brands uh, that you may have seen these nice cyber carbon cranks super light and their tight uh, and their carbon chain rings which aren't actually carbon I think they're 7075 with a carbon plate bonded on I don't think it's actually gonna add any stiffness because the stiffness index or the Young's modulus of a you know mixed twill weave like that 
is probably the same around 70 gigapascals as the aluminium so cutting it off and then sticking it on it's not really going to do much it's just aesthetic i think but maybe save a bit of weight of course but it's not going to add much stiffness not too much to see on the shimano booth but it is absolutely massive uh, disc brakes that get very hot and don't last very long and power meters that don't work just had a meeting with the classified ceo and cto and head of marketing to try and get to the bottom of their efficiency claims what do you think of that meeting then hamdini and they shouldn't have published their kind of efficiency claims before really getting that white paper out and because obviously you guys are technical you want to know the ins and outs of everything so you're not disputing it it's just a bit of a weird tactic to, to make these claims without really going into too much detail because it just leaves doubt so they're going to try and get us involved whether we're going to get a tear down um, or something to actually look inside the planetary gearbox system because my background is torque testing I'm doing back-to-back -back rigs for robotic joints and stuff so it's right up my alley building t torque test rigs to measure gearbox efficiency so kind of let them know that and then they their ears pricked up a little bit and uh, they've invited us to Belgium to, to check it all out but obviously they're very sensitive about what's inside because of Shimano and SRAM blah 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 right I'm here on the uh, campy stand it's actually pretty small considering they're only showing one thing but the rear mech is an absolute chunk it's massive my camera for scale it's a big boy super record the chainring options are just too small if you're a fast cyclist but you also want a good climbing gear the chainring options are just too small your smallest climbing gear i think is a if you want the 50 34 chain set 34 29 so we're coming up to my favorite stand not just for the free beer but the engineers so i just had a really interesting chat with uh trick stuff that's sante the uh, engineering manager also on the trick stuff stand is this company trump they're doing additive manufacturing laser sintering titanium and trick stuff are making some cool levers and small parts using that it's a bit like renshaw the uk brand i don't know if i'd stand on that trick stuff are using it to make custom levers Matthias from uh, Pinion and he's going to take us through the all-in-one uh, DC motor and pedal assist e-bike yeah. drivetrain system magic do it all box so please take it away from start to finish how does this work yeah it works um, basically in this two, in this uh, lower region we have our standard gear set which uh, is working with two gear sets the first one with four gears which yep. are um, going into our switching shaft and all the gears are freely turning on the switching shaft and the three wheel uh, gears on the outside shaft are connected to our um, crank crank yep. yeah. and depending on which gear it is um, coupled one gear on the um, switching shaft from the first gear set is connected to the gear uh, to the switching shaft and the second one on the second shift and then we have 12 gears in okay. total and now we included an electric drive motor mm -hmm. in the whole system which is located here yep it's an uh, motor of um, as an, an industry motor out of the um, automotive um, brand it's 48 48 volts, 48 volts yep. yes. and it um, pushes the, the torque it's torque to the to the second part of the of the gear set on the on the switching shaft good and yeah. then, then the small brush motor is for the gear yeah. selection right it's for the gear selection yeah now we have here a gear set with uh, internal gear and it's going inside of the the switching shaft where the ratchets are positioned. Right. Okay. Yeah. Compare that to a bottom bracket that isn't round. I don't know, let's find a bike where I can demonstrate this. So, Pinion are doing that level of engineering inside a gearbox, and we were joking at how frame makers love e bike drives because they don't have to make a round bottom bracket shell. All they need to do, okay, let's have a look at this. All they need to do is make six mounting tabs to mount the e-motor or the pinion gearbox or whatever and we were joking about now they're even struggling to make them the right width 
So if you get a carbon frame with the bosses too wide, you do the bolts up, it snaps the bosses. So that is chalk and cheese of the bike industry. You've got engineering like this, but the carbon frame makers can't make the right width bosses. Let's find... Uh... Okay, so this is kind of a, a modern example, but... These are internally like countersunk, so you can't see, but... Oh my God, is that case in point? No, that's just a bit. So I don't think that's cracked. But anyway, if the bosses on the frame are too wide, when you bolt the drive system to the frame, everything gets pinched in and it snaps. <laughs> just spotted this on the Lombardo stand. Aero e-bike, ultimate Fred machine, ultimate granddad racer, Crodder from Taiwan in the supply booth and I, these caught my eye, these adjustable cranks, sorry about the lens, uh, the shutter speeds correlating with the LEDs in here, nothing I can do about that, um, they are adjustable on this kind of sliding pinch bolt assembly. And these are meant for bike fitters, but I just got talking to them. They don't really have many sales in Europe at the moment. They're looking for distribution. I think they've got a UK distributor. But I proposed them a video, uh, an aero video on the TT bike. Because these are normally meant for the bike fit studio. And they fit on a single ring like that, 54 tooth. It'd be perfect for the TT bike. They have a 24mm uh, axle interface. They also make it in steel. And it'd be really interesting to make a video um, on those and just see what results we can get. I think they go from 140 to 180. So it'd be pretty wacky to do a 140 test on the TT bike at the ISO power, see if there's any aero differences. So the stand with the tallest people at Eurobike, I feel quite at home here, is Koga, Dutch company. They're making all sorts of bikes, but they're kind of known for their track bikes. Dutch track team. Anyway, this is probably subjectively the most aerodynamic bike I've seen at the show. It's a uh, Kinsey Pro top top row bike. Just deep, deep foil sections everywhere. Look at the head tube. I mean, that's barely UCI legal. It has a UCI sticker on it. So it is UCI legal, but it's a pretty deep head tube. Very, very deep fork. Deep down tube, front wheel cutout, rear wheel cutout. Deep everything. I, subjectively, of course, and I hate saying this but that does look rapid non-integrated cockpit well semi-integrated so that's quite cool seat post is pretty slim which is what you want on a stiff old bike like this up and down tire clearance let's have a look at that not the best no ah damn it was all going so well wasn't it but that's a 28 and the diameter is pretty tight uh, you could probably fit a 30 in there maybe even a 32 but it'd be pretty, it'd be pretty tight it'd be very tight down there for 30 so, shit roads. Not enough tire clearance for me. You're a schmuck. You're a cycling industry schmuck. <laughs>